My guest this week is Dr. Daniel Hume, who is a leading expert in artificial intelligence and emerging technologies. He is the founder and CEO of Citalia, a company that provides AI products and solutions for global organizations such as Tesco and PwC. Citalia was recently acquired by WPP, the world's largest advertising and communications agency, where Daniel now serves as chief AI officer. I've known Dan since university, and his unrelenting commitment to purposeful entrepreneurship and innovation has always inspired me. His mission is to create a world where everyone has the freedom to spawn and contribute to innovations and have those innovations become free to everyone. He is nothing short of a visionary and I'm super excited to speak with him. Daniel, welcome to Think Inspired. Hey, Daniel, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. How are you? <laughs> I'm great, thank you. So um, I know we've got a bit of a, a time limit today, so I want to get straight into it. Um, big question, first rabbit hole. What does inspiration mean to you? Oh, wow, what is inspiration? Uh, my brain operates in, in a strange way that I don't, I found out in my, in my early 30s that, uh, that people have a narrative in, in their in their head and they have like a voice and most people do i i don't so my head is empty so anytime i'm looking for inspiration i have to stare it into space and w wait for something to emerge from the from the darkness so um inspiration is very much a mystery to me that is such a refreshing answer because normally people they seem to struggle a lot more and it off, uh, oftentimes people you know they say that um they have to fill their heads with you know stimulus or mm. fiction or creative art or whatever and then hopefully something strikes where it sounds like you're you're almost the opposite of that so yeah. um yeah that's interesting that's one of the reasons we started this podcast as well because it does seem like a bit of a mystery everyone defines it in a slightly different way and it seems to be like elusive in nature um but clearly like you do a lot of um creative work i don't know actually if you self-identify as, as a creative person, but I, I really do believe that you are considering you've built so many products, companies, um, and interesting technologies. Um, so I, maybe, maybe we could start there. I'd love to hear uh, a little bit more about the company that you're building and congratulations on your recent acquisition, acquisition and success. And maybe you can talk a little bit about the inspiration for that as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and I'm sure that there are some very good definitions for, for creativity out there, and particularly given that Satalia has now joined WPP and WPP's <laughs> mission is to be the most you know, creative company in the world. Um, I, I, I'm still uh, getting my head around um, what, what that all means. And But but for me, what, what's important for me is it actually stems from a, a definition of innovation by Steve Jobs. He said, innovation is creativity that ships. And so you know, we can generate lots of ideas and, and new things, but but the, the the challenge is how do you actually get them to market, adding value, and 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 the process of generating ideas and getting to the market is a long and hard, painful challenge. Um, you know that yourself, being being an entrepreneur, and uh, and one of the things I'm particularly interested in figuring out how do you reduce the friction. Um, associated with uh, with innovations and, and and not only that how do we tap into the creative capacity of everybody in the world so that they can come up with ideas swarm around them and get those innovations to market as fast as possible i believe that we're going to face many challenges over the coming decades and and it's not up to the government or, or silicon valley to solve these problems i think that we need to tap into the creative capacity of everybody on the planet to, to come up with um, uh, solutions and, and get those solutions to market so yeah, my, my, my passion is, is, to, is to try to, to essentially remove the friction from innovation um, so that we can enable everybody to be, to be creative. Brilliant. Um, and, and just for those people who are listening who like hear this word all the time, AI, right? And, but still don't quite know what it is. Um, maybe, maybe just uh, you must get this question every single day, but just a, a general higher level definition just for, for a bit of context. Sure, there are there are actually two definitions of, of AI. Um, one is 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 popular, but I think is is weak, which is um, getting computers to do things that humans can do. So over the past decade, we've managed to get machines to do things that traditionally only human beings can do. So recognize objects and images, corresponding natural language, things that traditionally only human humans can, beings can do, we can now get machines to do. And because humans are the most intelligent thing we know in the universe, we then assume that that's intelligence. Now, <laughs> if I if I built a machine that could operate like a dolphin or a, or a, or a 
mouse, uh, one would argue that that's also incredibly intelligent. So I think benchmarking machines against humans is a, is a very silly thing to do. That There's actually a much better def definition of, of, of AI that comes from the definition of intelligence, which is goal-directed adaptive behavior. It's a really elegant definition and uh, goal directed in the sense we're trying to achieve something we're trying to achieve an objective behavior is how quickly can we move towards that objective but the key word is adaptive ultimately what we want to do is we want to build systems that make decisions learn about whether those decisions are good or bad adapt their own understanding of the world so that next time they can make better decisions so for me um, adaptive systems is really the true paradigm of ai and actually you tend not to see systems in production that can adapt themselves because they can adapt in ways that you can't predict so the, the first def definition really is linked to machine learning, deep learning, finding patterns from data now that in, in a way that humans can do. Uh, but the second definition really is, is aligned with the, the true definition of intelligence. And, and you actually don't need to have machine learning to have AI. As long as you build systems that can adapt themselves in production, you're aligned with that definition. Awesome. Um, if we could like, let's say, just play out that second definition a little bit and put on yep. you know our, our futurist hats like 10 20 years from now um what does that actually tangibly mean for um people for society and its relationship with with technology i know it's a really general question obviously it's going to depend on industry and context but um yeah it'd be great just to get your broad brush strokes perspectives on that yeah, um, well, but both both definitions actually have, will have a profound impact in on society. So the first definition and getting getting you know replacing tasks that traditionally humans can do will have a big um, impact on how we work what we work and, and, and whatnot. In the second definition, building systems that adapt themselves, it just means that we are able to, the, the world is going to move much more quickly. So software is going to get, get faster and smarter and better um, every single day. And um, it could also mean that we can reduce the cost of, um, mm. of, of innovations. And, and by re reducing the cost of innovations, by automating, by, by ever improving our, our, our software, our, our technologies, it means that the cost of production could become very cheap, the production of our um, uh, nutrition or healthcare or education. And, and so I'm actually interested in how we can use these technologies um, to reduce the cost of goods, make them abundant, which means that everybody can access them so that we can then give the people freedom to do what they want. So if we can give everybody in the world access to food, to, to education, to shelter, then uh, so they don't have to work for that, then it, we free them up to go and be creative and go and contribute positive, positively to society. So, so it, it, unfortunately, AI is synonymized with with technology, and and, and you know right. that's fine. But but the, the 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 true power is actually building incredibly smart technology that's constantly getting better, and and that means reducing the cost of of goods, which I think could have a massive positive impact on society. So that that's I mean that's almost utopian, right? In the way that you 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 depict it, and that's and that that's beautiful. Um, I'm curious, what do you see as the core um, sort of let's say risks and hurdles to adoption just beyond technology let's just assume we'll always keep getting better at that technological problem and and we are right um and that's that's pretty much what, what you're doing for a living um but what are the other areas where you feel like um that are just just serious you know either physical blocks or mental blockages as well and maybe just to get get you get get you started on this um we find that so many people are afraid of artificial intelligence, especially in creative industries. Um, and now technically you are in one of the biggest creative industries, right? And we feel that there's always this, there's this is almost like latent fear that, right? Like this narrative, it's been uh, just uh, almost sick to death of hearing it that like machines are coming and they're going to take our jobs and they're going to eventually become more creative than us. Um, I see yeah. that as like, um, so sometimes I see like the human creative ego, um, especially let's say in agencies, as a real like threat, right? Unless you can actually hand solve for that problem, um, some of these things may not even rise to the surface and be given a fair shot. So yeah, the, just one thought, I'd love to hear, hear, hear what you think about this. Yeah, I mean, it's one thought that has many, many different dimensions. So th there's actually a, a chap in WPP that's been thinking about creative intelligence, creative AI, AI for many, many years. Is a, a chap called Perry, and I'll, I'll introduce him to you because I think he would be phenomenal on your on your on your pod podcast. Um, so, awesome. so I think so. I think that there's, there's there's there is a lot of scaremongering around 
AI. There's also a, mis- a lot of misunderstanding. So there's two sides right. to this. One is that everybody's being seduced by promises of AI that's going to drive value in their business and, and, and whatnot. And, and I think that for the most part, people misunderstand what AI is, misunderstand um, how complicated it is to, to, to build, to maintain, to support. Um, and, uh, and I think that unfortunately, there's going to be a bit of a, a bit, bit of a bubble around, um, around a, a, a AI. And I also would say that people gravitate towards machine learning data scientists and i often remind people that they don't have data science or machine learning problems they have decision problems right. and decision <laughs> decision problems is, is a very different field in computer science and and, and anyway uh, i think that companies have been hiring the wrong people to solve problems they don't understand so the, on, the, on the on the first the, the first side of the, the the coin is that there's a there's a misunderstanding and that's been that's driven um a, a mishiring or an inflation of of certain skills that actually are not the right skills to solve problems in industry on the, on the flip side, um, those organizations that are getting it right, um, uh, and, and, and we will eventually start to adopt these, uh, these technologies properly. I did, a, I did a TEDx talk recently about talking, talking about the, the six possible singularities that, that could be facing us over the next several decades. And, and you know, there's a future world where, um, where we, don't, we don't know what is true we, we, based on the, the, the content that's being pre- presenting to us. I could be a, a deep fake right now. You might not actually be talking to a real Daniel. Daniel yeah. could be on his <laughs> uh, holiday somewhere and this could be a, 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 a deep fake. But so that there's a future world where, where we, we might not be able to determine what, what is true and, and, and that will have and is having political ramifications and, and whatnot. There's, there's a future where AI could help us cheat death um, and 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 or, or cure death, as some people yeah. like to, to refer to it, which is the which is often referred to as methusalarity, which is um, again what what would happen in terms of our social constructs and our relationships and how we educate ourselves in a world where where we know that we might not have to die. Um, there there is that there is the economic singularity, which is the impact on jobs. And you know, th- if we get the timing wrong, then the concern is that there is going to be a a lot of job losses. And I don't necessarily think in the creative industry, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But there is going to be a lot of job losses, and our economy might not be ready to be able to deal with that, which is why we need to be able to retrain people more quickly, which is why we need to tap into the creative capacity of more people to come up with new ideas so those people can get jobs. Um, but if we got the timing right, actually, I, I, want, I want to just make this clear that there could be a world where we didn't have to work. And that, but we can allocate our time to doing other things, right? things that might be positively com- contributing to each other's lives as opposed to um, 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 uh, paid work. Uh, but I mean, there, there, are, there are lots of things that concern me about, about, about technology. And, and as I said, it's not in the hands of the government, it's not in the hands of Silicon Valley, it's in, in the hands of all of us to be making decisions, to hold leaders accountable, uh, to make sure that we're using these technologies in a way that's gonna steer us to, to, to a world that is, is, is positive. If we're continuing to be um, uh, have the impulse of, of, of profit, of consumption, then we're gonna to continue to put pressures on our planetary boundaries, we're gonna to continue to put future generations in debt, uh, and we're gonna to continue to, to have these economic wars that we have between between countries and it's just not sustainable so um the ai blockchain these emerging technologies actually uh, could help us start to decentralize how we operate as a species and and then help us cooperate as a single species instead of fighting each other for gdp brilliant um you mentioned we could explore that same question through the lens of creative industries and i'd love to i'd, yes. I'd love i'd love to hear that as well. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that um, when when we look at AI and what AI can do, it's typically um, taking one of our senses, whether it be sound or sight or audio or whatever, and 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 then um, building a, a model that replicates or, or solves one specific task that, that that relates to that one specific sense. Now as we start to get driverless cars and other types of robots that are now starting to bring all of these different senses together it's much more complex to build by the way um, we will start to see ai do more complex tasks but um the the, the creative aspect is still as i as i mentioned it's still certainly a mystery to me and um and my guess would be that over the next decade is that is that these tools won't be used to replace creatives they'll be used to enhance creative so right. we could use ai to sample the search space of logos for example but it would still be down to the creative to say that looks nice that doesn't look nice and and then develop those into something that that 
that handles all of the context that you have to deal with as a creative. And, and I think that's really the key word. It's it's context. And, and that's where AI currently struggles. Um, it's understanding and, and linking together uh, and optimizing uh, within a messy world of, 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 of context. Across a long enough time span uh, and time horizon, do you feel that it will master context? I think I think that um, yes, yes, it will. I, I think that you know the, the the other singularity that I haven't mentioned is is the technological singularity, which is when we build a brain smarter than us in every single possible way, and we, we don't know what will happen when when we build that 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 um, that thing. Um, we don't know if it's going to be the, the most glorious thing that happens to us or our biggest existential threat, but but I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that anything that humans can do, we could eventually get a machine can, machine to do. That doesn't mean to say that we don't we won't still enjoy writing poetry or playing music or creating art. Like even if an AI can go and do that better than us, it doesn't mean it's, it doesn't stop our enjoyment of sex and eating food we will still yeah. do those things I'm, I'm sure um it just means i'm hoping that that more of us will get the opportunity to go and enjoy uh, doing those things as opposed to you know a very small percentage of the, of the, of the global pop population yeah i think i i think um kai fu li in his ai superpowers book talked a little bit about this as well that you know when um i think it was when an ai beat the human goal player Right. So it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, go is dead. Right. And so yep. now we'll just we'll just be playing for like the sheer pleasure of it, which is Indeed. a wonderful thing, which is something that like Indeed. should be, uh, you know, should be aspired to anyway. Yeah. People um, people still play chess. Right. And even right. Though, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So a um, few few things that I, I really love what you said right at the start of the conversation, actually, that, you know, uh, and, and I think it strongly ties back into the, the conversation about creativity that people, we assume that we are the most intelligent species in the universe, right? And we assume that we have a fundamental grasp of what like creativity even is, what inspiration is. And the reality is that we don't, all right? We, uh, most of our definitions of it are like, you know, more creative and poetic than actual rooted in, in hard science, right? We, we, like, we still don't really understand how the brain works. So to make huge assumptions about our own intelligence, I think it's just like, it's, it's just far-fetched, doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and with that in mind, I think you're absolutely right that uh, the word is not like automate, it's augment, right? It's like, how can you make uh, uh, creative thinking better for people? And how can you build tools that just like enrich that process? Um, one of the things I, I love what we're doing at Inspo is because like we've asked ourselves the question, like what are machines really good at currently, right? And what are human creative thinkers really good at? currently and we realize that okay machines like you know so much of like machine learning and everything it's like just computation on steroids right so it's great at sort of like brainstorming in the sense storming the brains and the thoughts of millions and millions and millions of people uh and quotes and corpuses in seconds and minutes and um, and organizing that for you and putting it in front of you but then it's the it's the role of the human creative to actually synthesize right and make meaning from it and that's where i think machines really struggle it's like it's not truly meaning making because they're just not necessarily conscious enough to make that meaning um but i i i, I did have an, another question for you based on everything that you've just said right and the fact that that like future it's so uncertain and we have no idea about the the dimension or the nature of that singularity um i guess a lot of it which comes down to ethics, which I know is something else that you, you think about, right? So how do you, um, how do you even, I, I'm not even sure how to phrase this question, because I don't want to say that how do you program ethics into a lot of this, but how do you even navigate that very, very complex and qualitative world of ethics in the context of all the stuff, stuff that we're building as well? Okay, I think, I think there's a, I think I was confused about this topic for for many years, and uh, and um, I think that I've now got more clarity. And, and I was helped actually by one of my good friends, um, Callum Chase, who who's a, a, an author in in, in AI. And um, I think that we confuse AI safety and AI ethics. So AI AI safety is is building systems in a way that make sure that they're safe. So if I build a system that um, mistakes uh i don't know a a child if i'm a, if, I, if i'm a driverless car and i build a, a system that mistakes a, a child for i don't know a turning and turns into the child then then that's not a, a safe a safe system um 
the 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 ethical question is that if I've got in my driverless car and I've in front of me I've got a kid and to to the right I've got two adults and to the left I've got a cliff and and the car can't stop who does the car kill? Who do you save? That, that, yeah. that, that that's an ethical question. And 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 to be honest, the, the ethical questions are actually not to do with technology. These questions are are are, exactly. are asked and deliberated. And, and have been for for millennia um, outside of the, the role of technology. So I'm 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 very concerned when I see people branding themselves as AI ethicists because if I say to them what what how would you feel if you called yourself an ethicist, they they should most of them feel very sheepish about that because because they haven't actually studied it ethics right. all, I've, all i've done is read a few books about the traveling salesman probably the, the uh, trolley problem and and a few yeah. books on, 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 <laughs> on, on, on so so i, I it, it, most of the questions are, are safety questions so the, the questions that are ethical questions are typically already dealt with with eth- ethical committees and, and things like that that there are already processes and structures in place to deal with some of those things where, where there is actually ai ethics is for example if we built a super intelligence that is sentient do we have the right to turn it off or, you know, should we be um, calling avatars uh, human names, for example? The, these are these are ethical questions, but the, these typically sit in the realm of academia. They don't sit in the realm of, of, of business. So I would be very cautious about 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 anybody that calls themselves an AI ethicist. And I did for a while. Um, I jumped on that bandwagon. But most most challenges uh, sit with safety, and that's where you identify biases. That's where you identify behaviors in software. Um, and you want to try and mitigate some of those negative behaviors. Now, that said, one of the things that I would like to do on my list to do is, as you said earlier, one of the things that AI is good at is taking all of this data. And in, in this case, what we could do is we could use an AI to read all of the corpuses of philosophical texts and religious texts and political ideologies. We could get an AI to read all of that stuff from Taoism to Buddhism, Stoicism, whatever, and and, and try to extract topics across all of that corpus of, of, of text to see if there's a, a set of um, uh, uh, pillars that we all agree on as a species. Yeah. And so what we could do is we could use AI to surface from that corpus of human knowledge. Are there things that we agree on across all of these things? And then if we do agree on them, can we then hold future AIs, future systems accountable to make sure that that they're not violating those um, those principles so one principle for example might be freedom or or or, or equality uh, and uh, we, we need to make sure in all of the systems that we build that we are not disadvantaging one person over another and then that that might be a a principle that exists across all religions all ideologies i'm not saying that it is and um, there's certainly some religions that don't think that we that we should be equal but um but but there might be some principles that we can extract there and and, and that's where we can start to to hold um, other systems or future AI systems um, uh, to account. That's so beautiful because it's almost like you're you're consciously designing for like a sense of togetherness, right? Rather than trying to figure out like where are we divergent, it's like okay, where what actually is the stuff that we we've been converging on, you know, tacitly, quietly, unconsciously for the last like thousand years or so. Um, one, one of the guests on, on this podcast was Gregory David Roberts, author of Shantaram. Um, and right at the end, um, and in fact, I'll, I'll introduce you if you're, if you're interested. Um, we just had a, just a, a sort of creative chat on artificial intelligence. Um, and he was talking a lot about like what it even means to be a human, right? And he feels that, you know, whilst we're having this conversation about AI and tech, sure, great, that will happen. And it, it, it's like newsworthy and headline worthy. Um, but I think before we even take big calls on that, we should ask what it even means to be like a person today. Um, and what is all this stuff that we have in common? So I just feel like there's a little bit of synthesis there, right? Indeed, it's one of my favorite topics. Amazing. Um, so uh, why don't we switch gears a little bit and just try something like a little bit <laughs> very spontaneous, impromptu, sure. wild fun. So before the call, I asked you, you know, give, give me a topic of interest and innovation as, as we got from this uh, conversation so far is clearly something that's really close to your heart. So on Inspo, our search engine for inspiration, I just just did a quick search on innovation um, and saved a few interesting pieces and thought starters. Um, some of them are questions, some of them are just kind of like a thought starter for a brainstorm. So I'm just going to, if it's cool, I'm just going to share them with you and it'd be great just to get your top of mind response. Um, sometimes it's a little bit unhinged, as you know, like, you know, machines are still like, it's still uh, not necessarily as advanced as, as, as people think. 
um, but it would be great just to get your perspectives. So um, one, one of the, the first questions, and this was generated using GPT-3 and also creative associations from Haiku Jam. And the question is, whose role is it to be innovative, machines or humans? Yeah, I, as I mentioned, my, I speak fast, but my brain is slow. So um, <laughs> whose role is it to be innovative? I, um, I think that uh, it, it, I think it doesn't matter for me. I, I want I want to try and improve the human condition, whether that's human beings coming with with ideas and, and and making people's lives better, or machines coming with ideas. I think in the in the short term we need to use machines to remove the friction of innovation. How how do we how do we make that process as fast as possible so that humans can come up with ideas and get those ideas to market if there's a future where machines are able to come up with innovations that make our lives better then then so be it i, I just want to try and create the the a society that has the least amount of suffering um uh, and, uh, and 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 the most amount of, of of happiness i love that that's beautiful so um here's another thought like a thought starter um which 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 i found fascinating actually so Innovation is often more about destruction and pain than creation and joy. Yeah, I think I think that's true. I, I think there are some other variants of that, which is that you tend to see innovation where there's scarcity and where people have to come up with creative solutions um, because because there is a lack of, of resource. And so that also on one side of it. It, they typically come through through scarcity and a, and a need to solve a problem. Uh, but on the, on the, on the other on the other side, um, uh, I mean, how, how would I articulate this? Um, they when you come up with something new, it's usually in place of something that exists. So it, it, it potentially is is replacing something else, which which is a is a process of destruction. Um, as, as well, and, and I guess during the innovation process, we also have to let go of some of our our, our conceptions and, um, and and free ourselves from the the, kind of the, the shackles of physics and, and society, which I guess is is also part of a, a destructive process as well. I guess. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Actually, um, I know we're, we're we're pushing time, so um, I'm gonna Sorry. just run one pass, one pretty big question past you. We've already kind of touched upon it, but um, it'd be it'd be interesting to dive just a little bit deeper. So the question is, if machines become more innovative than humans, then how will humans find purpose? Um, I, I, um, I, I, most of most of the people I they've done very well for themselves, let's say from a, from a financial perspective. Um, so that they, they, they don't have to worry about money. They don't have to worry about houses. They don't have to worry about feeding themselves. They don't sit there lack of purpose. Most of the people that I know actually have an impulse to go and try and make other people's lives better. And, and not, not just in the short term, but they invest in curing malaria in 70 years or trying to figure out how to escape from, from planet earth. I'm not necessarily sure that that's the best investment right now. <laughs> But 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 people don't don't sit around saying I've I've made like lots of money and and now I have no purpose in life. I don't think they 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 they, they have an impulse to go and make other people's lives better. So um, and I think that comes up quite a lot that concern. But uh, I'm not concerned about that at all. And and uh, I think that um, I think that, that we have an in, in it, if we didn't have an innate desire to try and make the world better for the next generation, we wouldn't have survived as a, survived as a, survived as a species. We have an impulse to try and ensure that our genes are going to survive, and that means trying to cooperate and make things better for them in the future. I, I yeah, I, man, I, I feel the same. I couldn't agree more. I feel as though sometimes I wonder actually. Um, so I, I don't actually believe that, you know, there'll be a world um, where uh, machines have displaced us in absolutely and every single context. But just hypothetically, even if that happened, right, sometimes I just wonder, is that almost necessary to realize that for us as a species to finally realize that we're actually here just to help love and support each other, <laughs> right? And there is nothing more to do, right? And just like be present and to play and to, to pursue bliss in whatever that in, shape or indeed. form, right? Um, indeed, we, we will we will still have desires, I'm sure, to, to like say, find mates, to 
to make people laugh to you know all of these all of these things i i am not concerned about that future at all i think it could be a glorious future yeah absolutely uh this has been a pleasure man i'm one last question request you know i found uh just in life and also for the journey of building building inspo that you know when someone inspires us uh we often we just keep it to ourselves we never really let them know um, and that's such a shame because that acknowledgement just could make someone's day, right? And make them feel just a little bit better and, and recognized. So yeah, final question. If there's anyone who's inspired you recently, um, yeah, if there's anybody, then perhaps you'd like to give them a shout out. I don't think there is any one person, not that people haven't inspired me, but I, I try and learn something about myself or other people from every single conversation I have. And, and I try to find time to have conversations with with everybody that, that, that reaches out because I have learned from all of those things. When it, when when you meant when, when you mentioned what does it mean to be human, my my hypothesis is that um, is that uh, there are there are pe people out there that are pushing the bounds of that stand on the edge of humanity. There are pe people out there that, that wake wake up in the morning thinking about haikus and go to bed at night thinking about haikus and dream about haikus. Or there are people that, that think about being a chef or uh, driving fast cars or creating art. There, there are people that are on the edges of humanity and typically, typically they're troubled people, but they are pushing the boundaries of humanity. And what, what, when, I, when I was in my early twenties, I, um, I, I could have realized that if I wanted to understand what it means to be human, I need to go and experience the results of their, of their passions to, I can't remember the philosopher, Will Durant, he said that we get to bask in, in, in the warmth of their fire. These people are on the edges, they're on fire with passion, and we get to bask in their warmth. We get to, to read the poetry, we get to eat the, the amazing food, we, we, we get to experience that art. And, and the journey that I've been on over the past 15, 20 years is trying to experience the bounds of, of, of all of those passions so that I can get a sense of what it means to be human. And I can get a sense of also where I want to push those boundaries. And, and so far, I want to be pushing those boundaries in philosophy and in, in, in AI. It might be that one day I want to push the boundaries in, in poetry or in, in something else. Um, but um, but yeah, everybody um, uh, uh, is an inspiration to me. Everybody helps me understand how to kind of piece that picture of what it means to be human um, together. All right, man, I don't think we could have ended on a more inspired note. And uh, sincerely just wish you all the best. I love how uh, just refreshingly like human your perspective is because i think sometimes when people may uh stumble upon your 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 bio right they'll think okay this guy is like a hardcore technologist but at, at, at the core of everything is just the as you said the human condition and uh, evolving that um so thanks so much for taking time for this this was such a pleasure it's a real pleasure thank you thank you man